to welcome everyone to this session with Professor Frank Diaz, and we're all very much looking forward to hear, hearing from him and learning from his expertise. Um, the Mind and Body series is a series of events that Project Jumpstart has put on in an effort to help students with their physical and mental well-being, which is more important than ever now that the semester is getting really busy. And we're very lucky to be partnering with the MTNA Collegiate Chapter, which has organized this event with Professor Diaz. So everyone, let's give him a silent round of applause to welcome him. Yay. Thank you. Um, just letting you all know that the session is being recorded, but we record only in speaker mode. So if you don't unmute yourself, you won't be seen on the recording. So don't worry about that. Um, if you do have any questions, please save them till the end. There will be a, a, some time left for questions so that we can just stay focused and present throughout the whole session. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Nietzsche to introduce Professor Diaz. Sure. So in today's workshop, we have a very special guest. Um, professor Frank Diaz is a professor of music and music education here at Jacobs. And many of you might have already met him and attended his Mindfulness Wednesdays last semester at the MAC. Um, he's the founder and director of the Institute for Mindfulness based wellness and pedagogy where he collaborates with a wide variety of artists and educators to help them find the best practice on the art of mindful living, teaching, and performance. So I personally took one of your classes um, during my master's several years ago, and it has really changed how I teach. So I am so glad to have you here to be able to share all your secrets with everyone else. <laughs> I just stole yeah. them. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, the boy, I'm just thinking that the class has changed so much. I think you were in the very first class, Nija. I think that was like the experiment. Like, what are we going to do? And, and last semester, I think in the spring, we had about almost 60 people enrolled in that class. Uh, wow. Kind of massive. Uh, and so th things have changed. And I see other folks here who have taken the class as well. So I don't know how many new secrets you're going to learn, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, um, first, I should just check, uh, is, is there enough? Uh, I mean, are you seeing the screen, my screen up there? Yes. Okay, great. Fantastic. Uh, that's good, because otherwise I'd be talking to myself. And that's all right, too. And, and, I, and I titled uh, today's session, Well Enough. <laughs> well enough. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be sort of a uh, part of the framework that, that I hope will keep our attitude uh, in check for the entire thing. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about mindfulness and wellness, we think it's an on and off switch where we say we're either like, oh, in some blissful state of relaxation, which nobody wants to be in all the time anyway, uh, right? That would be boring. Or we're completely freaked out, right? And, and sort of our, our culture celebrates extremes. We're in, we're in one state or the other. And I think all of us realize, you know, as artists, as sensitive human beings, that, that everything plays a part in wellness, right? Um, including uh, uh, sadness and grief and depression and anxiety and all these things are all part of what makes us human. And so I like to say, what, what do I mean by well enough? What I mean is well enough for now at this moment, what is the best possible orientation to my experience, to what's going on in my life that I could have that's gonna, that's gonna keep me healthy? Right. And whatever that might mean. And, and of course, during a pandemic, this is very different, um, you know, to tell people that they should be hunky dory and happy and super productive during a pandemic. is part of how we cause people to suffer because we're setting up expectations that are, are unrealistic uh, during a time in our lives that is very difficult. Right. So um, I, I'm still going to share some wonderful things that I think are very helpful, but I want to just if at the end of this, you're, you don't, you're, there are no rainbows and unicorns coming out of your mind and soul, it's okay. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of it as a, as a nice cup of tea that we're, that we're using to, to, to focus and feel a little bit better rather than some uh, massive transformation of your life that, that is going to stress you out just thinking about it, right? So we can all take a nice deep breath and go, okay, let's talk about this. But I want to start with some bad news. I'm going to start with some really bad news. One is we're not very happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, I want to frame this because in a way this is bad news, but in a way it's good news too, because it perhaps might make you feel less alone in your feelings. So I want to show you something that I think is really interesting. Um, there was a, a report, the World Happiness Report in 2019. This is a really interesting study where uh, psychologists uh, uh, poll every country in the world. They send this out to world governments and they say, 
hey, can you, can you sort of um, survey your population on these different things? Things like, uh, do I feel respected and valued as a citizen? Do I feel like I have good health care? Do I feel like I feel like my voice is heard? Do I feel like I have good education? Do I have running water? Uh, do I feel like I can make a difference? You know, all these different sort of societal factors that might help us, um, you know, that, that if are in place might help us at least have a happy and fulfilling life, right? And, um, and that's what these little bars here represent. They're sort of different facets of that. And we're not gonna get into that too much, but I want you to see where the United States is right now in terms of, well, where we were from 2016 to 18, right? We have dropped to about 19th in, in world happiness um, under Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Netherlands, Switzerland. Now, why is that important? Well, because all these countries that you see here, or we, we would call essentially economically sound democracies for the most part, right? They're, they're places where we would expect people to be pretty happy. Uh, because of the societal impact, right? We're kind of low. Uh, the next is the Czech Republic. And if you keep going, you start seeing some very interesting countries that pop up that you're like, wait a minute, we're that close to say it was Uzbekistan? I had no idea. Um, and, and when you look at where, how far we've fallen, we have actually fallen uh, more significantly on this list than almost any other industrialized uh, Western democratic nation, right? So this is just to say uh, alarm bells. This was 2016 to 18, no pandemic, uh, the beginning of what was probably a contested sort of uh, electoral process, right, that has caused other things to happen, right? We're in the midst, I mean, if someone were to do this right now, it would be very interesting to see where we are, right? So, so this is to say, when you add all that together, it is perfectly reasonable for you to be like, oh my goodness, things aren't going so great, right? And, and part, of it, part of what I want to talk about today is one of the ways we learn to get better and to deal with our environment better is to just admit that things are not great right now, right? By just having the, the courage to say, you know, this is hard. Um, we can start to make changes that help us reframe how we want to deal with things being hard rather than being stuck in this is hard, which doesn't quite get us to the next step, right? Or basically, <laughs> I, I found a, a version of this meme. I've seen it around. They usually show the little dog, like really happy with a coffee cup. And I'm always like, mm, you know, this is kind of where we are right now. Ah, <laughs> this is not fine, right? He's got a little mask on. I, I really appreciate that. Um, just some things about you, uh, college students. This is no surprise. A, a new report came out today. About three and four college students are feeling the effects of the pandemic. They're, they're sad. Uh, they're depressed or anxious, they're worried about their future. That's pretty much uh, showing up in a lot of different studies, um, some from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, we're also seeing that COVID is really affecting people who have less resources. And this is really important to think about too. Who has less resources? Well, college students for one have less resources, economic and otherwise, right? So we're finding that um, mental health issues are being exacerbated by in people like, for example, women, minorities, people with pre-existing health conditions and adults under 34 are reporting higher rates of fear and anxiety. So this becomes even more important to think about. So let's talk about what we can influence. So the good news is right now, you are not responsible for saving the world and you're not going to. Uh, you can vote, uh, you can eat well, as well as you can on a, on a college student budget. I know that's, that can be really hard. Uh, you can find places to practice at the Jacobs School of Music. Good luck. Uh, you can practice at home. Right? You, you have some things that you can control, but, but the situation in the world right now is, should not be on your shoulders. It's not something that you need to internalize and go, oh my gosh, I have to fix everything. Part of being well is deciding what can I work with, right? What is it in my life that I can work with? And there are a few things that I'm going to talk about today that I think at least are manageable. And one thing is, can we work on our state of mind? And my, my belief as, as, as a, a practitioner of mindfulness, as a researcher and a scholar in this area, is that I, I am a firm believer that if we had no agency over our state of mind, uh, this would all be hopeless. Because there is never going to be a time in, in society where everything is perfectly aligned such that we're happy. If we're waiting for everything to be perfect. That's just not the way things are. We live in an imperfect world where there are problems and sometimes in your life things are better and things are worse, right? And so, so we can't really change that so much. We can always try, always help, but, but realizing things, something's always going to be wrong. But we can work on our state of mind and how we relate to that. Part of that is what is our attitude towards things that are difficult? right? 
how do we how do we shape how do we look at our habits of mind how do we typically react to things and then finally is what we pay attention to i recently uh, deleted completely permanently my facebook account after 13 years 13 years um it hurt i felt like i was going but i'm like this has to be like what withdrawal feels like for some people because my entire i mean think about it the birth of my kid my marriage, grad school, my first tenure track job, all of my promotions. I had a narrative of my life for 13 years. And I just thought, you know, wait a minute. Every time I, I have never gone on this site except on my birthday <laughs> and walked out of the field, I feel so much better now. <laughs> Normally at the end of scrolling Facebook or Twitter, or what we call doom scrolling, I don't feel that good. Now I'm not saying get rid of your Facebook. Keep it. I mean, in a way, it can be really good. You, maybe you're stronger than I am, but I had very little control. I would click on that thing and it just gave me information. I would go, ugh. And I'm thinking, I just turned 45. I haven't written the great American novel yet. I haven't, uh, you know, gone on a spaceship to Mars. I can't even, you know, I don't have enough time to practice. I love playing the bass and I can't practice more than 15 minutes a day. What if I just got rid of this? How would my mental health? I, because it, I can choose what to pay attention to. Yeah, those Bodicini um, excerpts are hard and those etudes are hard, but, but, but I, have, I can pay attention to them. And, and when I master them, they bring me some happiness, a lot more happiness than scrolling on Facebook and finding out who I disagree with politically, right? Uh, it's the same thing in my life right now. I can pay attention to the fact that things are really, really difficult, or I can pay attention to the fact that I have a roof over my head. Both are true. They are both true things, but we tend to, right? We have a habitual sort of way of saying, I'm going to focus on the things that are wrong and difficult in my life, rather than saying, I can pay attention to that as well as the things that are good and find some balance, realizing that this is much more complex. And really, when we talk about mindfulness uh, outside, you know, the way it's depicted, <laughs> I know I've seen it in magazines, people all me on the beach, you know, uh, you know, apparently they have no, they have no work. The weather is always perfect. Um, they have amazing uh, yoga pants that they bought that, that must have cost like a hundred bucks. Um, no children to take care of, no partner, just somehow they're on the beach meditating. Well, if I had that kind of life, I probably could go to the beach every day and meditate and feel pretty happy. But how do you find that amidst, you know, what's actually going on in our life right now, which is more complex, right? So when I talk about mindfulness today, keep in mind that, that the way I'm going to define it includes everything. It doesn't leave anything out. And that's unusual because when you hear about mental health and when you hear about wellness, what we tend to think is I'm ignoring certain things or, or, or being rah, 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 rather than saying I'm, I'm facing my life fully and through that I get better because I have better tools. I get to have more choice over what I do. All right, so just a few things. So what if you say, well, Dr. Diaz, I like my misery. <laughs> I know some people who, are, who tell me things like, well, you know, if I wasn't miserable, then, then what am I doing with my life? Like, shouldn't I be stressed? Shouldn't I be angry? Shouldn't, it, shouldn't I be outraged? And, and my answer to that is, yeah, probably, but all the time, um, okay, what are the consequences of that? Let's just look at it logically. Let's just say you decide to be angry, outraged, stressed out. By the way, all for good reasons. Don't get me wrong. Plenty of good reasons to have all those things. So here's some things that happen. We call this distress, right? Well, what you're going to get is probably less sleep. You're going to get fatigued. Uh, you're going to have muscle tension. You're going to have headaches. This is from the Mayo Clinic. You're going to be irritable, have anxiety, lack of motivation, depression, probably have social outbursts, uh, social withdrawal outbursts and substance abuse for some people, right? This is, this is what happens when we're in a continual state. Now, Again, because I'm also really sensitive to the fact that, you know, aren't there reasons to feel these things and are these my fault? I'm not saying this is your fault, at, not at all. I'm saying these are, you know, we, these are part of our response to the world, right? And we can work on how we respond to the world different ways. And then you say, well, but if I don't feel this way, then I won't help other people and I won't help myself. And I like reversing that question and saying, if you feel this way all the time, you are not available to help anyone else because you're completely destroyed. It's like trying to get somebody, uh, give them a ride with having absolutely no gasoline in the tank, right? Well, you're not going to get very far. You're going to have to push that car the entire time. You can get enraged about it or you can go get some gas. So I'm saying if you care about the world, I do. If you're a person that cares about others and about yourself, realize that the, the, the sort of 
it's not ironic. Irony is not quite the word I'm looking for, but maybe paradox here is that we have to sort of put the oxygen mask on first so that we have the ability to help to put the oxygen mask on on other people. And that's where I think these practices are really important. Okay. All righty. So now finally, dun, 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 50 minutes later, I thought he was going to talk about mindfulness. Well, here it is. I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness because I'm also going to talk about self-compassion and gratitude which are two things that I think are really important. So what is mindfulness? Well, it's not a lady uh, on the beach with yoga pants, alming her way into uh, blissful oblivion with candles. I like that, but that's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is essentially, if you break it down, it's for what I would call habits of mind or uh, whatever cognitive and effective skills. By the way, that are important not only to living a, 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 a fruitful and I think meaningful life, but also to being a good musician, a good teacher. These are all just skills. So the first one is attention to the present moment. So my ability to attend to what's happening right now is very crucial because if I can't attend, if I can't focus, if I can't choose what to focus on, then everything chooses me. <laughs> and the thing is when everything chooses me, I have no control over it, right? Uh, I'm trying to get some homework done and then I have a thought and I'm like, oh, cool thought. Let me follow that. And then that thought says, oh, I should check Twitter because I was just thinking about that. And then now I follow And then 30 minutes later, you forgot what you were doing, right? Uh, because we keep following thoughts and sometimes it's harmless. It can be, oh, I wanna check out what so-and-so is doing, but sometimes it could be really, really negative, right? So our ability to say, hey, I, I, I have to attend right now is really crucial. Let me tell you another way it's crucial. It's crucial to your relationships with people, right? If you can't be present for another human being, if you can't be fully there in mind, body, and spirit, they're gonna know. And that's going to affect your relationships. If you can't be there in mind, body, and spirit when you're performing, people will know you're not there, right? Now, one of the awesome things about music is that it demands so much attention that in a way it doesn't give you room for the other stuff, right? So I always like to say like musicians are actually very um, uh, almost natural candidates for mindfulness because they're so, uh, they're, uh, the task demands it, right? But let's talk a little... I know I can get distracted. I was distracted last night because uh, I, I couldn't get a Boeing that I was working on. And, uh, and it was a, a Boeing and a string, uh, it was a shift and a Boeing that it just didn't work and it sounded bad. And I, I knew I just needed to work on it five more minutes, but all I could think about was, I suck. <laughs> that's all, just like angry little voice in there. And I'm like, oh, that's not helpful right now. <laughs> that's not helpful, right? And it's not true either. It's just the voice in my head that just comes out probably from when I was 12 years old that still lives in there saying, you didn't do it right. You're not going to pass your audition, right? And I want to pet it on the head and go, I get it, buddy. I get it. But I'm, I'm like a full grown up now. I don't need to be motivated this way, right? So attention to the present moment. Our ability to hold intention and be non-judgmental is a really interesting and important part of this mindfulness process. What does non-judgmental and intentional mean? Non-judgmental does not mean I don't make discriminations about things. It just means that I'm holding my experience with curiosity for a moment. It's about pausing and not going into reaction. So think about it for a minute. As things happen to you, every single moment that something appears in your attention and your awareness, you have a choice of saying, I'm going to let that go, or I'm going to follow it, or I have to do something about this, or I don't have to do something about this, or this is important, or this is not important. But if our emotions are in a constant state of judgment, they can be automatic, right? Because you learn automatic judgments in order to survive. I see something, it's bad, right? Well, maybe it's not bad this time. Maybe it's actually good, but you're missing out because your judgment is already saying, boom, I'm done with that. We do this with people, by the way. And when people talk about things like implicit bias, this is really what we mean. We learn emotional attachments to things, including people and how they are and who they are, and it clouds our judgment, right? And so by and, and activities too, a jury, I'll think of one, a jury can be awful if you've had bad jury experiences before, or a jury can be a wonderful, uh, a wonderful situation where you get to express yourself and show all your hard work. Wait a minute, what do you mean? No, both are true, right? But if my judgment is immediately, oh my gosh, it's a terrible thing, I'm, I've already shut it down. So being able to hold non-judgment, right, is part of mental health as a musician and as a person. And to extend that, even when we're practicing, right? Think about that for a minute. Why am I talking about practice? Because we're talking about musicians here. So I don't think we can separate our musicianship from our well-being. <laughs> I think that they relate to each other. So uh, permit me to combine these two as we talk. If I'm practicing and I make a mistake, I just mulled it before, I, I have one or two choices. I can make the judgment, I made a mistake, or I, I played the wrong note. 
What I don't need to do is what I did before. I made a mistake. I played the wrong note. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible human being. I am a terrible human being. I'm not going to get a job. I'm not going to get a job and I'll live under a bridge in the Midwest somewhere where it's freezing in the winter in a box and I'm not going to get any social support. No, you just missed a G sharp, Frank. That's all that happened. And now all you have to do is try a different strategy to fix that G sharp, right? And if I'm not careful, I'm going to go off the rails <laughs> thinking about this stuff, right? You're laughing good. In order to do that, I have to be aware of my thoughts and feelings. So it's not just being able to pay attention. It's being able to pay, notice my environment, be non-judgmental, and be aware of my thoughts and feelings. Um, if I am not aware that I'm all hyped up or tired, I might make some judgments and error that might cause other people to suffer. For example, if I'm not aware physically of when I'm angry or when I need to stop playing, I might keep playing and damage myself. Um, or I might keep doing something that is unfruitful, or I might snap at somebody without wanting to. Right? So our ability to be aware of our thoughts and our feelings so we can manage them is another part of mindfulness. And finally, this oh, I, I like intentional, non-judgmental, and curiosity, I think, are basically the same thing. Intentional means I'm coming with this, I, I have a goal here, and I want to accomplish a thing. And curiosity and openness is sort of the other side of that, which is as I'm doing this, I'm also monitoring and being aware of things that might get in the way. Okay. And you don't have to remember any of that because I'm going to teach you some exercises that, uh, that might help with it. Okay. And here's some outcomes. This is no surprise. People who are in this mindful state that is non-judgmental and present centered tend to uh, de uh, report decreased anxiety, a little better management of stress, reduced reactivity, improved sleep, some reduction in implicit bias and pro-social feelings. I like that. What is a pro-social feeling and behavior? Pro-social feeling is like feelings of gratitude, joy, awe, um, appreciation, Aesthetic feelings like, oh, the world is beautiful, even though it's a hot mess, it's still beautiful because I'm alive, right? So people who practice this over time tend to develop um, these particular attitudes and, and have these particular outcomes. All right. I'm going to skip the brain stuff. I usually talk about the brain stuff, but here's what I'll tell you. People are like, ooh, brains. Um, very briefly, <laughs> all of the things that I just talked about, all of these things right here, this is a way to talk about them psychologically, but, but, but from a scientific perspective, the idea is if, if these things are real, by the way, we experience it so it's real, but I'm just gonna play science for a minute here and say, okay, a scientist might say, well, but that's, that's all, well, what's changing, right? Is there a biological basis that's changing? Well, the reality is yes. Um, we, when people practice these things, these brain networks change. In other words, if you practice mindfulness, the part of your brain that does alerting, which is your ability to focus, you see differences in pre and post mindfulness tasks in areas of the brain having to do with focus, having to do with noticing distraction, having to do with letting go of distraction and shifting back to goals. So we do change. There are actual biological markers of this that change in the human brain that indicate this is not just something that we're imagining in some way. It's actually having a physiological and perhaps deeply neurological effect on us. Hey, anyway, just want to bring that up. All right, let's get to some practices right on time. I wanted to get, let's just talk about a really basic practice that you can try that I think is really, uh, it's really good as a sort of general practice for anything. We're actually going to try it here in a minute. It's actually quite simple. I didn't make it up. Um, a guy wrote about this many years ago, a guy named Andrew Wheel wrote about it. Um, Andrew Wheel, if you go back and look at his beautiful big gray beard, uh, you know, was recommending that everybody eat broccoli and garlic like 20 years ago. I don't know what happened. He's a sort of holistic doctor. I remember having this book, uh, you know, it's like holistic wellness or something. And, you know, aside of whether we make fun of Andrew Wheel's uh, um, beard or not, one thing he talked in there was he gave this exercise called 478, which has actually become, uh, it, it was adapted from yoga. It's a, what we call a pranayama exercise. So it essentially involved breathing in for four counts, holding your breath for seven counts and exhaling for eight counts. And, um, and he was doing it as a way of falling asleep. But what we know actually now based on, on, on certain types of research is that 478 actually activates your, um, your parasympathetic nervous system, right? By doing 478, you fool your body into believing it's in a relaxed state, right? You use, you use your breath to mediate it, and it allows you to, for example, uh, decrease your heart rate. Uh, it, it gets you out of what is called a fight or flight response, which is your sympathetic nervous system, right? I call it breathe it down. It's very simple. You sit or you lay down. 
you take four or five measured breaths, right? And then I add a little mindfulness component at the end. So let's go ahead and try that for a minute. Just, you might not be so stressed out right now. Maybe, maybe you are, because I'm talking so fast. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so you just sort of uh, take a position, very simple, just kind of nice and balanced. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to count. This is sort of the BPM, a little, little above 60. And we're going to breathe in through our nose for four counts through our nose. We're going to fill up our bellies. Okay. So just imagine it filling up your belly. You're going to expand all the way. You're going to hold your breath for seven counts, but not tight, like just kind of suspend. And then on the way out, I want you to make a whooshing sound. And you do it by putting your tongue behind your teeth. And there's, and this is, people always skip this step, but it's actually really important. The reason you whoosh is because it slows your exhaling of your air. By putting your tongue behind your teeth and whooshing, it slows down the exhalation. And slowing down the exhalation is really the key in this practice. The slow exhalation triggers a vagal response. It triggers your vagal nerve, which in, in turn triggers your parasympathetic nervous system. And that's why it makes sense to do that. We're gonna do a few cycles of this and then I'm gonna take you through something real quick. You ready? Relax. Let's take one deep breath in and out just to sort of a cleansing breath. All right, here we go. I'm gonna start counting in a minute. Ready? And in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, relax. Let your breathing return to normal. Let's do a couple more. Ready? And in, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, relax. Let's do one more. And in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, relax. And just for a moment, notice the sensation of breath coming in through your nose and out your nose, your mouth. Just notice, don't interfere, just notice it. Notice the sounds in the room. And open your eyes. Very simple exercise. Um, I really need, because I'm a pretty elevated person, I really need about six of those uh, to bring me down. Some people need about two, some people need about three. Uh, I'll just ask a few questions. How many of you feel physiologically maybe five to 20% calmer than you did before you started? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. How many of you feel your thoughts have slowed down a little bit? Maybe there's less stuff coming in. Yeah. Any of you feel um, slightly more connected to your environment? Like, oh, like I can hear sounds and anybody feel that way? Yeah, Jeff? yeah, yeah. Pretty calm. amazing, right? That took like three minutes, four minutes to do, right? It's very, very, imagine doing that before you practice. <laughs> imagine doing that before you start a task, right? Just remind it, oh wait, I could do a four, seven, eight. It totally changes the dynamic of what you're about to do, right? And getting back to mindfulness, what it has done here is that we uh, we did a vagal tony exercise. And then at the end, we went into focus. We focused on our breath. But because we were calmer, we were less distracted. There was noticing of that distraction. You're probably easy, easier to let it go and to shift back to the present moment and hear sounds, right? So it sort of physiologically and cognitively sort of slows the process down. So you can now try to concentrate on whatever it is without coming out of that incredibly reactive state, okay? That is the simplest one. And by the way, you could add more mindfulness at the end. What do you do at the end? Just pick something to focus on. I like to focus on the sound of of my breath coming in through my nose. 
or sometimes I just notice uh, the environment. Like if I'm outside or in a room, I'll just get really quiet and just notice sounds. And if I'm gonna transfer to playing, sometimes what I'll do, if I, if I do something like that, then I go on my instrument, is I'll just play open strings for a little while and just sort of listen to the resonance on the string. Just, it just keeps me grounded. It's like, oh yeah, that's beautiful. It actually makes me want to produce a more beautiful sound <laughs> because I'm in a much more grounded, much more present. I'm not coming into this thing like, you know, gangbusters trying to figure something out. Okay, that's a really simple one. I'm going to share, I've got a few more to share. Uh, mindful stop. And this one, this one's interesting. I'm going to take you through it and it doesn't require much. It just requires you to remember to do it during the day. Um, I, if you took my class, I might have taught you to do this. Maybe I didn't. Or I would say put, mind, put stop on your stand or you can put it uh, wherever you are and, and you remember what it is. And basically mindful stop is any time throughout the day where you're starting to feel agitated or you're starting to get, or you're transitioning between activities, which is when we usually get habitual, you basically stop. So let's say I, I, I'm in my office and I'm ready to go home for the day. Or I'm in my office, I'm ready to go teach a lesson. Before I walk out the door, I quite literally stop. <laughs> I've stopped moving, I stop walking, I just stop. I take a few deep breaths. Just letting my system sort of reset. And then I just notice, I want you to try this with me. Just notice right now, any physical sensation that's entering your body. So it could be the feel of the chair on your sit bones or on your thighs temperature in the room. Just notice any physical sensation. Notice your feelings right now. Are you feeling agitated? Are you feeling relaxed? Are you feeling angry, sad, hopeful? Just a notice. And, and you don't do it judgmentally. You kind of just do it as like a mirror. You're just holding up a mirror to your feelings for a second. Now notice your thoughts. What am I thinking about right now? You might notice there's a little person talking in your head all the time. <laughs> That's our inner narrative, right? Just kind of blah, 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 blah. Like it has to explain the world to you all the time as though you can't just take it in. And just kind of just notice that. And then think about the next thing you want. So even in this presentation, you can think, I. What's my intention here? Do I want to get through it? Do I want to um, learn something? Do I want to keep an open mind? Just kind of go back to why you got, you signed up for this thing in the first place. And just keep that intention in mind and go into this moment. Bring your presence of, that presence of mind into the moment, right? So if your point was, I want to learn something and you had this sense of, oh, I want, to, I want this to be done, then those are incompatible. <laughs> right. So you can sort of decide, hey, I don't, yeah, I get that that's how I'm thinking, but maybe I just let that go for a minute. I de-reify it and come back to the intention. It's a very simple exercise. I do this one a lot when I teach because sometimes I carry things over from my teaching to the class that I don't want to carry over. If I just got some bad news or I read a bad email or I was thinking about something, you know, it might take me a few minutes to realize, oh, it's not my student that's irritated. I'm irritated. And now I'm making them irritated because I haven't stopped to check that I'm irritated and they're you know, paying attention to me and human beings are empathetic and we pick up each other's emotions, there's emotional contagion. And then you might spend 15 minutes and you're like, why are we so irritated? <laughs> well, the cause of that irritation could have been something as simple as you just got an email right before you started that class or that practice session that bothered you. And by the way, there's nothing you could do about it now, but it just, it's there, right? But if you can let it go, if it's not an emergency and you can use the stop procedure, it takes just a couple minutes and you reset. And what I love is that it connects you to your intention. So let's talk about wellness and intention for just one minute. Prosociality, which is feelings like kindness, um, um, compassion, uh, empathy, um, altruistic behaviors, all these things are tied to well being physiologically and psychologically in any set of literature that you will read, scientific literature. It just simply means people who are kinder tend to be happier. People who are more generous tend to be, I mean, you, it, there is very little 
uh, that contradicts this in the literature. Despite what you might have heard about survival of the fittest and selfishness and all that, um, you know, uh, yeah, maybe you survive longer, but but that doesn't necessarily mean you're any happier, right? Um, and again, that, that's a debate we can have, but I'll, I'll just I'll just tell you where, what side I'm, I'm on. And so I like to remind myself that I want to be a kind person and that I want to be a person that treats others with respect and that wants to listen and that I'm not perfect. I don't do it great all the time and I'm not always on it. But if I remind myself of those intentions, I'm more likely to actually uh, uh, instantiate them in a situation than I am if I'm not. And the, what gets in the way of that is usually an unregistered irritation or habit of mind that I bring from one situation to another that I haven't thought about, right? So, so the stop technique for me is a way to recon, reconnect with, oh, my intention here is to be kind and my behaviors and attitudes right now, I don't have to feel bad about them, but if I keep fixating on them and if I don't notice them, I'm probably going to cause some damage. I'm probably going to... Um, uh, to treat someone uh, in a way that I don't want to. So this is an aspect of well-being that isn't brought up, but right now during the pandemic, goodness, you know, what we need is more kindness and more understanding and more empathy, right? I try to remind myself of that as a teacher and I'll, you know, sometimes a student doesn't turn something in and my initial reaction after years of teaching is, well, they didn't want to do it. And then I stop and I go, wait a minute, no, they could have lost internet yesterday or maybe they're dealing with a parent losing a job or, or maybe they're, they're dealing with a, an immigration issue. Uh, maybe they're dealing, I mean, there's so much that could be going on. And if we stop for a minute and remember that we want to be kind people, then we, we turn into solution. How can I help you? What is going to make this better for you? In what way can I assist you so that you can turn in your assignment? Do you need a little extra time? How much time do you need, right? By the way, most people, there are gonna be some people that take advantage of that, sure, but most people don't. And I'm not gonna treat everybody poorly based on the two or three people in my life who are gonna take advantage of my kindness. I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense to me. If, if that's the case, then we might as well never treat anybody well because someone eventually is going to take advantage of our kindness. I'd rather say if most people are gonna be okay with that, then I'm gonna be kind to people to the best of my ability, right? And that includes kindness to yourself, okay. Moving on, you get not only you're getting both a philosophical lesson, I'm being preachy, I'm doing all sorts of things you did not expect during this. All right, I want to I want to introduce you to something that I really like, and we're going to take a little quiz. I want to talk about mindful self compassion because I really suffer from, uh, with this. Um, so you're all like, yeah, Dr. Diaz, being nice to people is great, being kind, but I bet we there are a lot of us that do that to other people, but don't do it to ourselves. Uh, oh yeah, I, I can understand being nice to other, but should I be nice to myself, right? And I see this a lot with Jacob students. Part of the reason you're here is because you beat yourself up psychologically for many years to get here by being competitive and being really good, right? And you're like, yeah, well, I don't want to lose my edge, you know? But the reality is, yeah, that's a dangerous edge, right? A knife can, you know, you can use a knife for good or you can cut yourself. Be careful, Right, uh, we 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 want to keep that edge, but we don't want it to get so out of control that we're we're so mean to ourselves that that we lose that motivation over time. Right? Okay. So, uh, Kristen Neff is a researcher at UT Austin. She does some great work with mindful self compassion. I'm going to share um, a couple things about it, and then we're going to take a little quiz, and then we're going to do a mindful self compassion thing. Yay! No, the quiz. There's no grade in the quiz. No judgment. Okay, I'm not reporting it to anybody. All right, so the first thing is, there are three components of mindful self-compassion, which is, can I be kind, am I, do I tend to be kind to myself or do I judge myself a lot, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and guess that most of us tend to be more judgmental uh, in general, especially in our culture. Number two, do I feel isolated in my judgment and pain or do I feel like other people also feel that, right? This is a really key component in Dr. Neff's study, which she finds that when you realize that everybody around you is suffering in some way, you actually feel less worse. Not because it's schadenfreude. It's not like you're like, oh, you're suffering too. It's like, oh man, yeah, you're suffering too, aren't you? I'm not alone in this. This is part of the human condition. We all suffer, right, in different ways. So then we get out of the suffering competition, which is a very dangerous one, right, which is who's suffering the most? Sure, somebody who isn't being given food and whose life, you live in a war zone, is having a harder time, obviously, than somebody who just failed a jury, right? We, we get that. But psychologically for people, that's not the way it manifests. People suffer. I mean, th that, that's, that's, that draws us all together, right? So to the degree that we can say, 
I feel the same as other people, I mean, other people are suffering, it changes our attitudes and, our, and, and our, our, our tendency to behave and think in certain ways. And then the other one is mindfulness versus over-identification. So when we are mindful and we're aware of this and we just say, okay, these are, these are things that are happening to me right now, it's normal, rather than, oh my gosh, I'm overthinking and you know, I'm, I'm so identified with my suffering that I can't get away with it, uh, I can't get away from it. These three factors, play a big role in how we, um, whether self-compassion manifests in our lives. So I'm done talking about it. Let's take a quiz. You ready? Okay, here's the quiz. It's 15 uh, questions, pretty fast. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, this quiz, and basically, it's really a survey. I shouldn't call it a quiz. Uh, and you'll say, if, if you agree with it, if, if whatever the statement is, if it never happens to you, write a one. If it always happens to you, write a five. If it's occasional, two, three, you get the idea, right? So if I say something like, I get angry all the time when my ceiling fan doesn't turn on. Uh, if you agree with that, if that never happens, you're like, no, I don't really care. You say one, no. But if it's almost always, it's a five. I'll remind you throughout. Question one. And by the way, take notes. Like actually do this, okay? Because we're going to score it at the end. Number one, when I fail at something important to me, I become consumed by feelings of inadequacy. If that never happens to you, write one. If that always happens to you, write a five. When I fail, I become consumed by feelings of inadequacy. Number two, I try to be understanding and patient towards those aspects of my personality I don't like. <laughs> one is never, five is always, I'm always understanding and patient with those things about my personality that I don't like. And then you might be somewhere in the middle, two, three, four. When something happen, uh, something painful happens, I try to take a balanced view of the situation. One, never, five, always, two, three, four, in between. And don't think about it too much, kind of take a gut like, some of you are like, wait, is it a two or a 2.5? I'm not sure. I think it's 2.49. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Next, four, five, and six. Same thing, number four. When I'm feeling down, I tend to feel like most people, most other people are probably happier than I am. One, nah, they're just as miserable. Five, yeah, I think other people suffer too. Five, I try to see my failings as part of the human condition. One, never, five, always. Six, when I'm going through a very hard time, I give myself the caring and tenderness I need. One, never, five, always. And Netflix and, and wine counts as tenderness to yourself. So you know, don't, don't be too judgmental. That's, sometimes that's my self-care. <laughs> it's perfectly okay. <laughs> All right. Number seven, when something upsets me, I try to keep my emotions in balance. One, uh-uh. <laughs> Sorry, uh, one is uh, never, yeah, and five, yeah, always. Go ahead and do eight and nine. You can read. You're full-grown adults with a college education. Okay, moving on, just six more questions.
Actually, that's it. Yeah, it's only 12. I forgot. So 12 version. Okay, you all ready to do some math? It's very simple math, okay? <laughs> all right, so um, what you do is you're going to add some of these just as they are and then divide them and some you're going to do what's called reverse scoring. Don't worry about the logic of that. So for number two and number six, put those two numbers together and add them. Whatever you wrote, just add them as they are. For 11 and 12, you're going to reverse score them. So instead of adding the numbers that you wrote on your under, under 11 and 12, you're going to reverse score. So what is a reverse score? If you wrote a one, you're going to, you're going to actually add a five. If you wrote a four, you're going to add a two. If you wrote a three, you're going to keep it at a three because that's a neutral number. So you're going to change those numbers to the reverse end. And that's what you're going to use to score it. And as you see here, you're going to do the same. Uh, you're going to do regular scoring for five and ten, reverse scoring for four and eight. So there again, you're going to switch the numbers around, three and seven, one and nine. So you're going to have one, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve numbers that you're going to add together, and then you're going to divide them by twelve, and you're going to get an average. And it's okay to use your calculator if you want. Did not mean to do that. All right, this I like to put in the chat. So if you feel comfortable, I'm always curious, uh, put your number in the chat. Where did you end up in terms of these qualities? Were you a two, where, where are you? Let's see, if I did the math right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we tend um, we tend to be a little lower. Uh, this is not surprising. This is very usual for music students to be between two and a half and three, and very few get three point five or five. Now, part of me gets really sad when I read that, and I'm like, oh, why, why does that happen, right? But but I want to show you some sort of general consequences of that. Oh, somebody got a high one. I see. Let's see. Who was that? I know it's not showing up on my chat. All right, uh, Jeff, <laughs> Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's all right with himself, but he, you know, he's, he's older, he's figured it out, it's okay. No, really, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> so here's what we know. When people score, so these three qualities, the higher you score, the more likely you are to have these qualities. So for example, the higher you score in self-compassion, the, the less likely you are to be afraid of failure. That's a big deal for musicians, right? It, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but actually being more self-compassion means I'm a little less scared of messing up. The higher your score, the less you are likely to be depressed and anxious. Duh, right? I mean, yeah, a lot of self-criticism is not gonna necessarily bring us to happy, right? But here's my favorite, maybe as a person who is like a do-gooder, the higher that number is, the more likely you are to be kind to other people. Right, so self-kindness is, is a way of generating kindness for other people because we tend to project out into the world what we feel on the inside. Um, and, and again, if part of the, of the mission here is, you know, and I, I believe this strongly being a, a Jacobs professor, yeah, I'm very interested in high quality. I want, I want the folks who graduate from here to be incredible musicians. That makes us a different school. Let's just put that out there. I want my scholars to be fantastic, but, but I, I really, really want us to do that with a sense of community and caring so that the people that walk out of, out of the school are good people and good musical citizens of the world. I, I strongly believe that. Um, and I think the time to ignore that is over. We, we can't ignore that anymore. You can't be in a symphony orchestra or in a faculty or in, in any institution and go back to the days where we can just treat each other like who and expect it not to under the guise of excellence or something. Oh, I'm just a jerk because I want you to be excellent. Well, why don't you want me to be excellent and also not be a jerk? The two are not incompatible. You know, why can't I be a good musician, but also be incredibly generous with my time and with what I do? You know, one of my, one of, one of the most beautiful people, and I've only met him once, I saw him at a, at a symposium in Tanglewood is Yoyoma. You know, a, a wonderful cellist, but you, you spend five minutes in the presence of that guy 
And you can tell there's like an innate kindness and an innate curiosity and interest. It just makes the room glow when you're around them. I haven't felt that with every amazing classical musician I've met, to be honest, right? And again, it's a choice, but, but I feel like he's probably a little happier being that way, being that just So it's just something to think about. Okay, let's do a little practice. We've got enough time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Kristen Neff take us through a practice. And by the way, Elizabeth, I will send this PowerPoint to you and you can, you can get these things. But um, I'm going to go to uh, Kristen Neff's site. This is one that I've really, really uh, come to a lot lately and uh, recommended to a lot of folks. And I'm going to go ahead and put that on here. And we're going to do a little guided meditation. Kristen's going to take us through one. So this is her site, Dr. Kristen Neff. Oh, what happened here? Okay, yeah, Compassion Meditations. And we're going to do the self-compassion break. It's five minutes. All right, hold on. I'm going to, yeah, I think you'll be able to hear it. So just sit back and let's listen. This practice is called the self-compassion break. And it's something you can do anytime during the day or at night when you need a little self-compassion. So to practice this exercise, we actually need to call up a little suffering. So I'd invite you to think about a situation in your life right now that is difficult for you. Maybe you're feeling stress, or you're having a relationship problem, or you're worried about something that might happen. I'd invite you to think of something that is difficult but not overwhelmingly difficult, especially if you're new to practicing the self-compassion break. So finding the situation and getting in touch with it. What's going on? What happened? Or what might happen? Who said what? Really bring the situation to life in your mind's eye. And then I'm going to be saying a series of phrases that are designed to help us remember the three components of self-compassion when we need it most. So the first phrase is, this is a moment of suffering, right? We're bringing mindful awareness to the fact that suffering is present. And I'd invite you to find some language that speaks to you. Something like, this is really hard right now. Or, I'm really struggling. We're actually turning toward our difficulty, acknowledging it, naming it. This is a moment of suffering. The second phrase is, Suffering is a part of life. Okay, we're reminding ourselves of our common humanity. Suffering is a part of life. And again, finding language that speaks to you. It may be something like, it's not abnormal to feel this way. Many people are going through similar situations. Right, the degree of suffering may be different, the flavor of suffering may be different, but suffering is a part of life, part of being human. And then the third phrase is, may I be kind to myself in this moment? And to support bringing kindness to yourself, I'd invite you to Perhaps put your hands over your heart or some other place on your body that feels soothing and comforting. Feeling the warmth of your hands, the gentle touch. Letting those feelings of care stream through your fingers. May I be kind to myself. 
And using any language that supports that sense of kindness. Perhaps language you would use with a good friend you cared about who was going through a very similar situation. You know, it may be something like, I'm here for you. It's going to be okay. I care about you. You can even try using a diminutive if that feels comfortable. You know, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Or you can try calling yourself by your first name. Anything that feels natural to express your deep wish that you be well and happy and free from suffering. And then letting go of the practice and noticing how your body feels right now. Allowing any sensations to be just as they are. Allowing yourself to be just as you are in this moment. <coughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I always find that practice to be very powerful, um, especially at the end. Uh, there are two things that really flip it for me. One is when I imagine telling of somebody I love or I care about something, it's, it's harder for me to send it to myself, but I imagine, oh, what if this were my daughter who were in this moment, right? What would I tell her? I, I would definitely say, no, sweetie, it's okay. It's okay. You know, we're going we're gonna to be okay. Daddy, daddy understands. Right, and so it, it, it has a very clever way of, of, of externalizing and then bringing it back to ourselves and say, okay. And then, you know, it's interesting, if any of you have ever done therapy, and I'm, I, I'm a full, uh, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, therapy isn't just for people who are uh, in pain, it's for if you're well too, it's okay to visit a therapist every once in a while uh, to get a check, it's perfectly fine. The one, one thing I learned from a really powerful therapist one time was that, you know, you have to talk to yourself. The brain does, it's not enough to just say, oh, I understand that. It's almost like the self-talk by saying something like, hey, Frank, you're okay, buddy. Like using a diminutive, like I'll do that to myself. <laughs> like, wow, you had a, today was just rough. You're, you're right, bud. You're right. And I almost imagine like a 12 year old version of myself, right? That little vulnerable kid who knows just enough, but is still so naive about life and so naive about the world. You know, it's very hard not to want to go back to your 12, inner 12 year old and give, give him or her a hug and say, it's going to be all right. Right. And so I, I try to find it. That's for me. It could be very different for you. But for me, I try to find that aspect of myself that needs the self-compassion. Maybe grown up Frank thinks it, this is too cool, but, but little kid Frank could certainly use a hug. Right. And really they're the same Frank. It, it, it's just different aspects of ourselves that we come in contact to. Anyway, Powerful exercise. Um, I always feel different after doing it, and I highly recommend it. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to share one last thing with you here. I think we're almost out of time. Is that right, Elizabeth? Yeah, okay. All right. So we won't get enough time to talk about uh, this last thing, but I want to talk just very briefly about gratitude. Um, and specifically, uh, there's a great researcher here at, at U of I. Uh, U of O, I'm thinking, I don't work at the University of Oregon anymore, uh, at IU, <laughs> uh, who does research on self-compassion, on, uh, on gratitude, and there's a lot of really interesting outcomes, more pro-social, it's kind of similar to self-compassion. People who are, have, show gratitude exercise more, what? Uh, have better life experience, more optimism, and oh, it's Wong, uh, he's in the education school. And he has this really, really interesting research about a gratitude letter or journal. And basically, here's the gist of it. What they did is they asked people three different things. And one, they just wrote things that they were mad about. <laughs> and the other one, they just uh, wrote um, uh, nothing. They write whatever you want. Right? Like, no, no, there was nothing being done. And the third one was gratitude. And they compared general outcomes from it. And the gratitude letter is interesting. You write a letter to somebody who's done something for you in your life that's really meaningful, but you've never expressed it to them. I can think of so many people, so many people. And it's, it doesn't have to be long. It's like, hey, you know, 20 years ago, you really bat, you know, went to bat for me. And I just want to tell you how much I changed my life. And you just send it to them. And you don't expect anything in return. 
And then some people say, I'd love to just tell you in person. I'd love to read this gratitude letter and just meet. And it is amazing what writing a gratitude letter does for people, right? And the, and the short version of that is doing a gratitude journal, just a couple of things, times a week, just saying, here's some things I'm grateful for. It's about focusing on what we want to focus on. So what's fascinating about this is the research, I'm going to shut my computer, uh, this down. The research indicates that of all the things that we can do, this is actually one of the most powerful and long lasting effects. So writing one gratitude letter has a wellness effect fact, what we call a shelf life that is still present almost six months later. Think about that for a minute. Six months later, the people who wrote a gratitude letter were generally happier and uh, generally less stressed out than the people who had written the, what's all the things that are wrong in my life, <laughs> right? And again, my bad is they both had things in their lives that were wrong and things to be grateful for, right? But they, one person you choose at certain moments in your life to focus on whatever you need at that moment. And it makes a big difference, right? And so gratitude is, is a way of, of realizing that, sure, there are things that are bad, but there are also a lot of things that we can be grateful for. And that changes our attitude and, and our well being. Okay, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for showing up on a Friday. <laughs> no, I think everyone can agree that that was an amazing pre presentation, Professor Diaz. And Thank I think you. we all feel a little bit more relaxed, but you've also given us a lot of food for thought. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, well, take care of yourselves. And, yeah. Uh, Thank you so healthy. much. I, I'll just mention to everyone that you'll probably want to go back and review some of the exercises that we did in this presentation. So once Professor Diaz shares the PowerPoint, I can email it to you. And we'll also post the recording of this session on the Jumpstart YouTube channel. And I'll put that link here if you want to subscribe and also the MTNA YouTube channel. And if I have that, I hope this is the correct link. So that's it. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you again, Professor Diaz. Okay, thank have a wonderful too. day, everyone. Right. You too. Bye-bye.